Okay, uh, we're resuming. This is panel three. This is the panel on contaminated site cleanup and redevelopment. So I'll ask people to come on in and, and, and take their seats. Okay, we are resuming now for everyone in the back. Um, and this panel is moderated by Monica Schreck of Greenbaum, Rowe, Smith, and Davis. Thank you, Michael. This is the contaminated site cleanup and redevelopment re by panel for uh, the people that do uh, brownfield redevelopment or site cleanup or deal with CERCLA and RECLA. This is the panel for you. Um, Sarah Flanagan is going to be our first speaker. Sarah manages the New Jersey Superfund branch of the EPA, Office of Regional Counsel, Region 2, which handles legal counseling and enforcement with respect to New Jersey Superfund sites. Ms. Flanagan joined EPA Region 2 as an assistant regional counsel in the New Jersey Superfund branch in 2001 after a decade in private practice. She has been in her current position since June 2016. She's a 1982 graduate of Brown University and a 1991 graduate of New York University School of Law. Please welcome Sarah. Good morning. Um, I just want to say a couple of things in advance. One is I, as Monica noted, I manage the New Jersey Superfund branch, so I am not a subject matter expert in RICRA or, oh, sure, I'm starting again. Uh, as Monica said, I manage the New Jersey Superfund branch in Office of Regional Council, so I'm not a subject matter expert in RICRA or New York Superfund, New York Caribbean Superfund matters. So I wanted to thank my colleagues, uh, Wilkie Sawyer and Tom Lieber for contributing to my presentation. And uh, I guess the other thing I wanted to say is I've been at EPA now for um, 22 years. And when I started, I some of my, my colleagues asked me if that was a wise move, moving to EPA, because the Superfund program was on the off-ramp. So I just wanted to say that 22 years later, I think the answer turned out to be it was probably a fine move. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of not being on the off-ramp, um, what's new in, in the current framework, time framework, since our last uh, meeting, um, our last, the last Columbia presentation a couple of years ago, uh, bipartisan infrastructure law funding. So we have a lot of money, and uh, 3.5 billion is being, from, from the law, is being invested into remediation at NPL sites. Um, the vast majority is going to EPA-financed remedial action construction projects at non-federal NPL sites, uh, clearing up the backlog of 49 previously unfunded sites, starting new construction projects when they're ready, and accelerating the ongoing cleanup at NPL sites. Uh, quite a number of Region 2 sites were lacking funding and have now received funding. So um, that's, it's a very busy and exciting time for us. Um, just in case people were wondering about the reinstated Superfund taxes and what the impact of that will be, we don't really have too much to report on that at this time, so stay tuned on that. Um, speaking of new Superfund sites, we have finalized a listing of five in the last couple of years, Pioneer Middle Finishing and Lower Hackensack River in uh, New Jersey, and in New York, Meeker Avenue Plume and the Brillo Landfill in Victory, and in Puerto Rico, the Ochoa Fertilizer Company in Guanica. So some of those are pretty big sites, and that will also be keeping us busy with those new funding sources that we're going to be experiencing. All right, moving on to some updates on law and policy. We continue to support redevelopment at uh, contaminated sites, uh, cleaned up, and in the process of being cleaned up, that's an important aspect of our 
our programs. So since May 2021, we've issued a number of new and updated comfort status letters. And uh, we have also issued a new edition of the Revitalization Handbook, which will summarize um, federal statutory provisions and enforcement documents and provide a, a good description of enforcement tools that are available to address liability concerns associated with RICRA CERCLA. And that'll be a helpful guide to the development community. And um, also on the legal front, we've issued a new model administrative settlement for removal action by prospective purchasers, which is, um, provides a, a covenant not to sue for existing contamination and contribution protection. And it also includes some enhanced community involvement provisions, which I'll be touching on a little bit later and are associated with our focus on uh, our commitment to protecting communities with EJ concerns. Alrighty, uh, another big topic that I think is on a lot of people's minds these days is PFAS development. So I'm going to go through a few of those which are relevant to the Superfund program. Um, importantly, EPA issued the uh, October 2021 roadmap, which identifies uh, a sort of a framework, three primary goals for addressing PFAS, um, research, restrict, and remediate. And consistent with that, um, proposed, EPA has proposed the designation of PFOA and PFOS as circular hazardous substances and is working on an enforcement discretion policy with respect to PFAS at Superfund sites. Also relevant to Superfund is the proposal of some new um, standards, drinking water standards, MCLs, which will come to in a minute. And also I, I think uh, Phyllis Feinmark's gonna talk more about that later. Uh, and initiation of two RIC rule makings. And then some other related matters such as designating PFAS onto the list of risk-based values for um, cleanups. Okay, this is a lot more information than I'm going to cover about the hazardous substance proposal, but uh, the takeaway here is um, a notice was published in the Federal Register in September 2022 about the proposed designation of PFO and PFOS um, as hazardous substances, and the comment period is closed, and EPA is in the process of reviewing comments and has, as I mentioned, um, is exploring a potential enforcement policy related to PFAS contamination. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of sort of reporting on that, so I, we probably don't have too much to say about the policy itself since it's just under consideration right now, but um, that's gonna be potentially a very significant development. All right, so again, mentioned that um, EPA's announced MCLs for uh, uh, six PFAS, including PFOA and PFOS, PFNA, and several others. And that, the, the announcement was published in um, March of 2023, and the public comment period is New York and New Jersey have already established date standards for some PFAS substances. So EPA in Region 2 has been looking for PFAS at Superfund sites in um, Region 2 on an ongoing basis. Okay, RICRA. So again, um, this is not my area of specialty, but I uh, wanted to note that uh, EPA's initiated two rulemakings in response to the New Mexico governor's petition asking that PFAS be identified as hazardous waste under RICRA. Um, those two rulemakings, I believe, are underway and I think being reviewed by um, OMB at the present. Uh, one is uh, an, a rulemaking to add four PFAS chemicals as RICRA hazardous constituents, uh, and the other would clarify in current regulations that the RICRA Corrective Action Program has the authority to require investigation and cleanup of waste that meets the statutory definition of hazardous waste under RICRA 1004-5. 
So that would clarify that emerging contaminants such as PFAS can be cleaned up through the RICRA corrective action process. This is just a general uh, reference of some of the RICRA authorities touched on by the, the roadmap. So I'm gonna continue along to the next slide. So now switching gears a little bit on to some other big policy issues that are um, of continuing importance to EPA, environmental justice and climate change as those relate to RICRA and CERCLA. Um, I wanna echo what, what Candace had said, which is that um, EPA is sort of using an EJ lens um, as we proceed with our, you know, everything we, we already do, but we're doing it maybe with an enhanced kind of understanding and focus. So um, in that context, uh, EPA has issued some, some documents that, that help guide decision makers and, and EPA decision makers and, and partners to understand what our authorities are to consider and address um, environmental justice and equity in decision making. S what that means, for RICRA and CERCLA cleanup sites and communities with EJ concerns, I would say, um, initially, we can certainly say expect more robust communication about enforcement instruments and compliance and focus on early action to address urgent health concerns. Um, I'm gonna come, oh, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about the new model RDRA consent decree and statement of work, which is, for, uh, for uh, Superfund cleanups, I think exemplifies some of this approach, in particular with new deliverables relating to community involvement and community impact mitigation. So we're gonna be weaving that more explicitly into our um, all of our investigation and cleanup models, outreach to communities, providing information in the ways that communities can understand it and um, obtain it and also receiving feedback so that we can incorporate those, those thoughts and issues into our processes. Um, for, with respect to climate change, we are exploring a number of ideas, including under RICRA, looking at facility contingency plans to address potential climate impacts, vigorously enforcing UST regulatory requirements that enhance resiliency, and we're also looking at ways to incorporate climate resiliency, mitigation, and adaptation principles into RICRA and CERCLA cleanup processes. Consistent with our legal authority, of course. All right, moving along to some recent um, decisions and, and I guess pending decisions. I, thanks. Um, just no, nodding to the case before the Supreme Court that um, concerns a question of whether declaratory judgment on liability would trigger a statute of limitations to seek cost recovery. Uh, I'm not really gonna say much more on this because it's still pending, so I was hoping there might be a decision by now, but we'll have to come back to that next time. Uh, so there hasn't been a lot of litigation, I would say, in Region 2. Since, since the last Columbia event, um, but we have had a, a couple of uh, cases relating to access, which is under, for Superfund matters, which is sort of surprising. Um, so, you know, here's a nice example. Um, we, it involved a, a removal action at um, a commercial business in New York. EPA had issued an administrative order for access under CERCLA and the owner of the contaminated property um, resisted access, ultimately did agree to grant access, but also challenged the order for failure to comply with APA and CERCLA's requirement that access to property be limited to reasonable times. And the court held that the plaintiff had unreasonably denied access and EPA can issue an order when a property owner attempts to dictate the schedule and manner which EPA discharges its duties. And I want to mention in particular, just because we have seen in, uh, I would say recent years, 
a surprising number of examples of parties being unwilling to provide access, and so there's, that's been an increase in our, our practice, but um, ultimately, uh, I, I think it's safe to say that we do, and achieve that result, we end up obtaining access. So, food for thought. Okay, I'm very short on time, so I'm going to now just uh, skip through the last few slides and say we have a robust RICRA enforcement program. I um, noted a couple of UST examples in my slides here, and also um, another focus of RICRA organic air emission cases. So I urge you all to look at those and understand where we're going with that. And we have uh, also a very active CERCLA enforcement program. Again, many settlements, actions, and um, including settlements with prospective purchasers and developers. So hearkening back to my previous comments that we do uh, support redevelopment. And then I threw in a few updates on some of our big sites in Region 2, big sediment sites. So uh, no point in going through those all, but if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to ask at the end. And I think that is it for me. Great job, Sarah. And we're going to introduce Patrick Foster. He's the regional director for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Region 2, covering the five boroughs of New York City. As regional director, Patrick works with his senior program managers and staff to ensure that the dedicated environmental professionals serving throughout the legal environmental quality, remediation, natural resources, environmental education, and permitting programs in Region 2 have the tools to effectively conserve, improve, and protect New York's natural resources and the environment. Wow, that's a pretty big job. <laughs> Patrick is a graduate of Indiana University, Bloomington, and received his JD and MA from the city of New York. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Monica. Can everybody hear me? Yep, great. Um, so just to start off with, in case there's any confusion, yes, I'm the director of Region 2, but that is DEC Region 2, not EPA Region 2. Every time I hear Region 2 today, I'm triggered a little bit. But there, <laughs> there are two Region 2 offices in uh, New York City, and we are the state of New York, and our office is in Long Island City. And also, as a plug, if there's any law students here, we have a very robust internship program. We love <laughs> Columbia Law students to come to our office, so um, please apply. Um, but not for this year because we already have our interns. Um, so I uh, started off as a remediation attorney uh, in Buffalo, New York, and uh, now I am full bureaucrat, but I will do my best to um, inform you about what's going on in our remedial programs, including a little bit of an overview of the state's programs and some updates. Uh, and then I wanted to highlight some DEC and EPA uh, cooperation and coordination on a few sites. And uh, then I was asked to focus on emerging contaminants, so we'll talk about the legal framework in New York State for addressing emerging contaminants. So, as I said, I started off in Buffalo as a remediation attorney, and, and this is an a image of Love Canal always looming large in New York um, State. Um, in our history with remediation, it is a very large program area for our agency in a um, very uh, strong dedication to remediation throughout New York State. So these are our primary remedial programs uh, at New York State DEC, our state super fund, um, which as the name implies is very much like the federal super fund. That's was enacted in 1979, I think, before CERCLA. Um, and then we also have our environmental restoration program from 1996, and our brownfield cleanup program from 2003. Um, of course, the state superfund program is our enforcement program. We have statutory obligations to remediate um, when that program is triggered. Our registry is akin to the NPL on the federal level. 
And um, if you have a class two site, um, that parlance means that it is a significant threat to public health or the env environment um, and will be remediated. The environmental restoration program um, is focused on municipalities and providing municipalities throughout New York State with funding so that they can um, conduct remedial actions on their own property, primarily. Um, it's very dependent on funding, and uh, we were sad, frankly, that we didn't get more funding for it uh, in this past budget season, but we will try again uh, next year. Um, there is still funding for this program, but a lot of it is already committed. Um, it's also not applicable to New York City. It's for other smaller municipalities. And our Brownfield Cleanup Program, um, which many here might um, work with. Um, it's a very popular program, as you'll see on an, another slide. It's our vol voluntary program. So in this program, uh, developers and other property owners uh, would enter our, uh, this remedial program, and um, if they complete the program, they get tax credits. So it's an economic development program as well as a remediation program. And those tax credits can be extremely lucrative. Um, there's two different types of tax credits. There's tax credits for the cleanup activities and then also um, what we call tangible property credits. And those tax credits are for the development itself. It's harder to get those tangible property credits, especially in New York City. So as an overview, you can see what we did um, last reporting period, 21-22, um, to give you some um, sense of scale of these programs in New York State. So it, um, when I say completed, that means that a site received a certificate of completion. That's a liability release from the state. Um, and the Superfund program issued six of those. And as you can see, the Brownfield Cleanup program issued 41 of them. So much larger program in terms of issuance of certificates of completion. The Superfund um, projects are oftentimes much more complicated. And of course, we go through all of the uh, legal um, mechanisms that are necessary in order to find responsible parties for those sites. Um, so they're legally complex as well. Um, it's an older, older program. You can see how many uh, the state has completed um, lifetime to date, and also how many sites are still active. Not all those sites are in active remediation, of course. Some of them are in site management, um, but they're still on our registry or in various stages of investigation. And there you can see our ERP, our Environmental Restoration Program. There we had one site completed um, last reporting period but 32 sites are still active. We'd like to make that more. In 2022, there were amendments to the Brownfield Cleanup Program law. There have been a number of amendments since it was first enacted. These latest amendments, um, um, big ticket item, items here, new gateways for eligibility for those tax credits, those tangible property credits in New York City. So in New York City, if you wanna get those particular tax credits, the legislature has determined at this point in history that you need to have an affordable housing project, for example, or some other category of project, including now a renewable energy facility or a project that's located in disadvantaged communities, generally. Um, there were also bump ups for tax credits statewide in the above categories. So in other parts of the state outside of New York City, it's much easier to get those tangible property credits and you get more tax credits now if you have a renewable energy project or you are in a disadvantaged community outside of New York City. There is now a $50,000 application fee to enter the program. So that might give you a little sense of how lucrative this program is because there's a $50,000 application fee to get into this voluntary program. That's brand new. And this program, um, of course, um, uh, flows through the legislature and the legislature determined that it should be extended through 2026. So it will be around in this form, we imagine, until then at least. All of our environmental remediation programs are, um, the regulations for them are found in part 375, six NYCRR that you've heard before today, part 375 in this case. 
And uh, we recognize that those regulations need to be changed. We've been in a regulatory process to amend those regulations for quite a while. So some of you might have, have seen slides like this previously. Um, but the re revisions uh, that we've been working on for a while um, are meant to increase consistency, again, across all of those remedial programs. The revisions would update our soil cleanup objective contaminant tables. So the way that our programs work has um, been described as a cookbook. Uh, if you are undertaking a remedial action, you need to um, achieve one of these soil cleanup objectives for an intended use when you're doing your remedy. So these revisions would update those tables. Um, we had a rulemaking package out, but it expired in April. Um, which means that we need to re-up it, which is not necessarily a bad thing, as, as uh, we're going to talk about today, there's some action happening in PFAS, um, so we can potentially incorporate that into a new um, Part 375 rulemaking package. But it should be released for public comment shortly, um, and the newest version at this point um, incorporates the, those amendments to the Brownfield Cleanup Program that I mentioned. So to highlight a little um, DEC EPA cooperation, this slide is showing um, the powerhouse building, which is on the Gowanus Canal. This was a uh, remediation project um, under the Brownfield Cleanup Program. So just to talk about a couple different sites, there are a number of sites, of course, that we work with EPA on across New York State, but focusing downstate here. Um, Hudson River PCBs, this is a very long-term project. It's been going on for a very long time. It's taken a lot, lots of twists and turns over that period. Um, now the focus is coming down to the Lower Hudson, which we're all very happy about in my region too, uh, at DEC, down here in the city. And um, as part of that process, uh, we've uh, had requests from env environmental groups for new angler surveys. Those angler surveys inform our New York State Department of Health guidances for fish consumption uh, throughout the uh, Hudson, Hudson River estuary. Um, so uh, there will be another round or rounds of angler surveys that will be um, undertaken that will update um, our fish consumption advisories. And those will in turn um, inform EPA's work um, in the Lower Hudson on that federal Superfund site. Also, Gowanus Canal has been mentioned a couple times. Uh, the distinction between the state and the federal government there um, is that the state is handling all of the upland sites around the canal, making sure that no contamination re-enters the canal, and uh, EPA is focused on the sediment cleanup and the in-water work there. Just to note, there is also a natural resource damages process, and New York State DEC is the designated agency in New York State to undertake that process. Um, that process seeks to make the public whole for the environmental injury um, that the public suffered at federal Superfund sites like Gowanus Canal. Um, so at the end of the day, there should be a number of restoration projects that come out of that process that will be separate and distinct from the cleanup that is happening at the Gowanus Canal. And DEC works with um, different federal agencies in that process. We work with US Fish and Wildlife Service and also with NOAA on that natural resource damages process. And lastly, but definitely not least, is the Meeker Plume. Um, the Meeker Plume was uh, designated uh, an NPL site by EPA in 2022. DEC, prior to that, has done a lot of work in the area to identify different sources. I believe we identified six separate sources in that geographic area. We're very happy that um, EPA is now um, fully engaged um, in the Meeker area and looking forward to enhanced um, cooperation and coordination with them there. So PFAS, this is a picture I think that comes from the Hoosick Falls area, which was the hot spot in New York um, for PFAS that I think put it on the radar for many people. 
So these are mechanisms for remediation of PFAS. You can see here that I've been talking about three separate programs in New York State, and there's an additional one up here, which is ECL Article 27, Title 12, Drinking Water Contamination Sites. This is um, very specific to drinking water um, sources and public water sources. Or, uh, and it was enacted in 2017 under our Clean Water Infrastructure Act. So it is new as well. It allows for the mitigation of contaminants in drinking water across the board. Um, the definition of contaminant is actually found in the public health law, section 1112. Um, that's where there's a definition for emerging contaminants. And uh, also in this law, the legislator, legislature originally included a list of chemicals that um, had to be included um, in the public health law. The public health law, section 1112, was recently amended. So the governor signed that update um, earlier, or early last year, and it removed PFOA PFOS and warp 4 dioxine, di dioxane from that list of emerging contaminants. So in New York State, those are no longer emerging contaminants. Um, but it added 23 new compounds, which are now emerging contaminants. And that is significant because now those um, compounds, PFOA, PFOS, and warp 4 dioxane, dioxane are um, standard contaminants in New York State law. So this Title 12 um, program is similar to State Superfund, but it is limited to public water supplies. We call these sites D sites for drinking water sites. There's only two of them in New York State, um, in the Hudson Valley and in Western New York um, is where they're located. But these are sites where DOH needs to take action, quote, um, to reduce exposure to an emerging contaminant and has determined that the concentration constitutes an actual or potential threat to public health. So this title is focused on emerging contaminants, so it's no longer focused on those compounds that have been, in essence, delisted. New York State DOH has uh, adopted um, maximum con contaminant levels, MCLs, for PFOA and PFOS at 10 parts per trillion, and then proposed for those other um, compounds uh, a number of other MCLs. So I need to um, wrap up, which is good because I'm on the last slide, let's just go here. Um, as you just heard, EPA issued um, their proposal for um, two uh, da -da, compounds and then um, their MCLs and for us, just to hit it home, what that means is that if they are finalized and when they are finalized, this will allow New York State the ability to seek cost recovery for our remedial work, which we have done a lot of. So we're waiting on that. Thank you all. Thank you, Patrick. Only in New York City can you ask for a $50,000 application fee. <laughs> <laughs> Sean <laughs> <Shh, laughs> Moriarty serves as De Deputy Commissioner to Commissioner Sean Latourette. They're spelled differently, but they're both Sean. Sean leads DEP's internal legal team on all matters of regulatory compliance and rulemaking and oversees the Office of Enforcement Policy. He also is a member of the Commissioner's executive team, providing input on priority initiatives that include climate change and environmental justice. Sean received both his undergraduate and law degree from Rutgers University. He lives with his wife, children, and two energetic dogs in Haddon Township. <laughs> Welcome, Sean. Thank you. Let's see how this works. Oh, oh there we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. Best part about this job is getting led into places that I never would have gotten led into when I was younger. Um, as a Rutgers graduate, uh, Columbia was not um, on my horizon. Um, also, thank you, Monica, for clearing up. I'm not Sean LaTourette. I am the other Sean from DEP. Yes, there are two of us. Um, and yes, I have gotten to the, uh, to the precipice of the top of my field and am second, the second Sean um, in the department, um, a, an issue I deal with every day. So. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, our site remediation work, 
PFAS, but I want to I want to try to lead lean a little bit more on the redevelopment aspects of what we do, right? So if you have your if you have your bureaucratic bingo card out, like you're going to get points for climate change and environmental justice along with PFAS from this one as well. Um, so we'll continue to do that, um, which is good. <laughs> Everybody should be talking about those things, right? Like these, they are critically important. So we're going to weave them into everything, whether you like it or not. Um, so we do a lot of we do a lot of work on remediation. We have the the New Jersey Spill Act. Um, you know, similar to federal CERCLA, we um, are able to 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 um, to seek cost recovery under that act for a lot numerous things, including PFAS. We fortunately don't have to wait for the federal government on that one. Um, and a lot of those cases get, get the big headlines, right? We've filed cases um, that are kind of a cross between natural resource damage recovery cases and um, remedial um, action cases to address PFAS statewide with a lot of the big big contributors. I won't name names, but if you've looked at any of the Attorney General and the Commissioner's press releases, you know who those folks are, right? So we are pursuing those. Those get a lot of headlines. Um, but there's, you know, that P, there's a lot of meat left on the bone from a natural resource damages perspective, right? And I want to talk about that and when the recent action um, that, the, that the department has taken um, and the commissioner's issuance of um, a brand new administrative order that really attempts to get at some of the, get more at those cases that fall below that kind of headline threshold that, that aren't the big cases, right? Every, every remediation case, at least in theory, and I'm sure there's some attorneys in the audience who will test us on that theory eventually, um, has a natural resource damage component, right? It's that delta between meeting the standard and what it used to be, that clean, that kind of virgin uh, groundwater, soil, whatever, right? So what we're trying to do through the administrative order um, is to create better process internally. And there's two aspects of that. First, we really want to work on more voluntary settlements with RPs, right? That is, that is the most efficient way to do it. Um, I, know it I know that the, um, you know, some of the lawyers in here don't make quite as much money off of that, and I get it, but <laughs> from our perspective, in terms of returning value to the people of New Jersey, um, most kind of directly being able to con compensate for those for the injuries to our natural resources, a voluntary settlement ends up being a much better path for us. So we want to be able to encourage that. So we're trying to we're trying to create information. We're going to continue to update um, our outreach, and that, you know that that work is continuing um, at pace in the department to try to find ways to um, give people information about how you can calculate natural resource damages, um, provide a you know a clearer path to coming to the department. Um, to propose a natural resource damages um, settlement without feeling like we're going to play gotcha. The other part of that, when we talk about how every potential remediation case has an NRD component, we're also trying to, you know, kind of routinize more of the way that we approach NRD through our standard remediation processes, right? So we're going to be creating kind of new touch points to NRD within um, our remedial um, program through, you know, when you get to an RAO, when you get to that remedial action outcome, you get that permit, we're going to have things that are part of that activity that are going to ask about natural resource damages. And we're trying to set up kind of, um, you know, thresholds to allow for a quick and easy calculation of what that might look like to free that liability, to get rid of that trailing liability. Um, you know, we don't want to have to chase folks some number of years later. We'd like to be able to, to do that up front and then be able to kind of, as we said, return more value um, to the people of New Jersey. To do that, um, and you know, this is kind of this like idea of environmental justice, this idea of like better connecting the work that we do to our communities, right? Like that's kind of like at the core of the environmental justice idea. So we are creating the Natural Resource Restoration Advisory Council. What that's going to do is kind of bring folks together um, from different kind of cross, um, what's the word, kind of uh, cross-disciplinary team of folks, a council that's going to help, help us to guide how we spend the natural resource damages money, right? So if we settle any of these big old cases we filed, we're going to have millions of dollars come into the state that are going to be, need, need to be spent on restoration. We want to identify those, those um, projects. We want to kind of work more transparently and more openly with our communities to better identify where, where the money should be and have a kind of a better connection in terms of how that's done. We have found um, more recently that when we don't talk to folks and we think we've come up with something really, really good, that often comes back to slap us right in the face, right? You end up in multiple, um, multiple uh, community meetings being yelled at for hours at a time. So we want to be able to avoid that, right? We want to, we want to be better, right? We try to learn lessons um, at the DEP. Moving on to PFAS, everyone's favorite topic. This is like the sports center highlights of what we're doing, and right? I'm going to go quick. <laughs> I'm on like I'm at least on one and a half, maybe 1.25 if I'm doing well um, on the on the podcast speed as I'm talking. But PFAS, obviously, critical issue for everybody. Federal government's working on it. New York's working on it. We're working on it, right? So we have we have um, our MCLs, our drinking water standards for PFOA, PFAS, and PFNA. Now we're not as good as you, which is really disappointing for me to see here today. Um, we also have groundwater standards. Um, but you know, the thing with PFAS is right, every time you put a standard out, 
um, somebody else makes a new compound, right? So you're, you're always kind of trying to chase that. Um, so, you know, part of what we're doing here now is trying to close some of the gaps of the things that we know are present in the state of New Jersey. Um, whether it's Gen X, whether it's uh, clip fika, this, this other very long multiple, multiple consonant thing that I can't really, can't really, I can't even really kind of, I can't really even understand what those letters are when I look at it. But, um, you know, these, these newer compounds, right, they're not the PFO, they're not the, they're not the ones that folks know about, but they're everywhere in New Jersey, right? And they are from, often from very specific companies, and we have to work with those companies and develop very specific standards to address those. So we're in an interim stage on several of those. We're going to continue to push that forward. Now, obviously, we're waiting for what EPA is going to do, right? We're ready for that to happen. Those standards are lower than ours. When those go into effect, um, in, from, a, from an MCL perspective, they're going to override what we do, right? We're going to be able to, to work on those lower standards. But um, what I'll tell folks is you should not expect the state of New Jersey to sit on its hands and just, just defer to EPA. You guys are doing a great job. We want to do New Jersey-specific Jersey science. We want to always have our own standards in place, um, you know, in case one of them becomes a case, right? We don't want that to happen. We want to have, you know, multiple, uh, multiple backstops on this that are in line with the most current science. So we're going to continue to work to update our, our numbers um, and to try to get at some of these PFAS compounds uh, before they're introduced. And what we're doing here, um, you know, and a lot of the lessons that we learned from our experience with PFAS, which has not always been smooth, is that we need to have a clear and specific playbook for contaminants of merchant concern. Right? We need to have an outline of how you take a specific issue and turn into an appropriate standard and how those standards then flow through it, right? It's not enough to have an MCL. An MCL has to be a groundwater standard. It has to be a soil remediation standard. It has to be all of these things, right? So we're, put, we're working on putting together um, our playbook. We expect um, sometime in the next couple of months to kind of talk a little bit more, more publicly about what that looks like from PFAS perspective, where we expect to go, and then when the next contaminant of emergent, emergent concern shows up in our water, in our soil, hopefully we will be better prepared to move more quickly and to protect the people of New Jersey. EJ, right? Bingo. So Candace talked about it, and she talked about it much more articulately than I ever will. Um, but you know, when you talk about remediation, you talk about redevelopment. I want to talk about two specific um, kind of regulatory things that are going to affect development in the state of New Jersey. Now, neither of these things, whether it's environmental justice or whether it's work on climate change, is going to prevent development in the state of New Jersey. I have to say that because folks still don't believe us. It's not possible to prevent development in the state of New Jersey. If you've ever been there, Things are everywhere, right? <laughs> but what, EJ, what the environmental justice rules are going to do, and our approach generally to environmental justice, right, is to filter all of the work that we do through that lens, right? We're looking at overburdened communities, our term, and we're looking at how those communities are stressed when compared to others, right? We're look, doing comparative analysis, not a cumulative impacts analysis, but a comparative analysis. Um, and what we're trying to do is focus on those communities that are sub, or they're already subject to adverse cumulative stressors, right? So we're focusing more on the specific levels of stressors when compared to not overburdened communities in the state. But what this, what this rule will do, which we frankly are thrilled to have finally completed as of April of this year, um, and kind of being able to draw from the information on EJ map, is you're going to be able to see where all these communities are, and you're going to be able to assess those stressor levels. And what those stressor levels are will affect what the development, the easiest and clearest development opportunities are in overburdened communities, right? So the EJ law covers a fairly narrow subset of development opportunities, right? It covers solid waste facilities. It covers large sources of air pollution, so your Title V permits, and it covers wastewater treatment plants. So that's like, that's, it's like eight specific facilities. There are a ton of other opportunities, right? So as we move through that, and it becomes more difficult, because it is going to be more difficult, the law says it has to be more difficult to site new facilities, new of those covered facilities in overburdened communities. That's going to open up opportunities, and often on contaminated properties, often on brownfields, for other types of development. We're excited to kind of walk down that path. We're excited to bring what we hope to will be more beneficial development opportunities to our overburdened communities in a way that they may not have before, right? What we see, and what I'm sure Ken has talked about, what, the, what the, the data tells us, look on EJ map, it's true, you know, there are an abundance of those facilities in our overburdened communities, right? It is a disproportionate number, a density of facilities, density of solid waste facilities, density of major sources, right? This is gonna change patterns of development going forward. Speaking of which, check out our website. It's got a ton of good stuff. Flood rules, right? So climate change, we gotta deal with that. And that's going to affect how we develop everywhere, right? We have contaminated sites in, in our flooded areas, particularly in some of our overburdened communities. There's a clear overlap there, right? And particularly in kind of the northern, northern part of our state, in Newark, in our more urbanized communities, uh, we have contaminated sites that are going to be subject to things like sea level rise. They're already subject to increased flooding. So what we're trying to do um, at the department, and it's kind of in two steps, is to fix our standards, right? Our standards are way outdated, whether it's a stormwater standard that relies on um, 
relies on numbers from 1999, which if you just hear the word, the standard, the, the phrase, the standards rely on numbers from 1999, you should see how, how um, inadequate that really is, right? Think about where you were in 1999. I was not at Columbia. Um, <laughs> we got to update that. We got to update those numbers, right? We got to take into account all the changes that we've seen from a climate perspective, from an intensity and, and um, frequency of precipitation perspective uh, between 1999 and now 2023. So we're going to do that, right? As we do that, we also want to account for future changes, right? So we have, we have New Jersey specific science that allows us to do that. So we're updating our stormwater standards in that manner. And we're also updating our flood standards. Our flood standards are being updated to account for that, those, that additional um, depth of flooding. So we're adding a two additional feet to, to what we already have, right? We have the FEMA maps. We're now adding FEMA plus three, used to be FEMA plus one. We're trying to you know, keep pace with, with the changes that we're seeing in our environment. The second piece of that um, is updating our standards in our coastal zone, right? So we know New Jersey has an incredible coastline. We have a lot invested in that coastline. It is a big part of what it means to be from New Jersey, right? You go to the beach. If you're not, if you're not from there, you say you go to the shore, right? Mm -hmm. um, we got to protect those areas, right? But we have, to, we have to make smart decisions, and we have to be cognizant of the fact that we cannot stop sea level rise from impacting those areas, right? What we expect to see by, by 2021, so a short, frankly short 80 years from now, right? When you talk about the, the lifespan of a building, that's a, 80 years is a short period of time, we expect to see five feet of sea level rise all, all along our coast. It's a big deal, right? That's, and that is also kind of taking like a mid-range projection. Like the, the worst numbers are like the apocalypse is coming and we can't, you know, you don't regulate on the apocalypse. You try to regulate on something more reasonable. So in those areas, we're gonna be adding five feet of sea level rise. We're gonna account for five feet of sea level rise in our flood hazard pools. What that's gonna do um, is ultimately affect how folks develop in those near shore areas, right? So again, while we're not trying to like prevent specific development, we're not saying you can't build things. What we're gonna ask people to do is to build those things with, with open eyes, right? To do, do it with a level of disclosure and a level of analysis to assess what the costs are of building in those areas. We think that's critical. We can allow it to be a, build, a business decision, but we want that business decision to be informed. And we want the markets to ultimately catch up and start to have more complete information as people are making those decisions. We think that's fair, right? We're not telling you you can't build there, but we are telling you if you're gonna build, here's the information for which you should make those decisions. This also includes an, inund an inundation risk zone, um, which is kind of, you know, those, really, those, clear, those near shore areas that we expect to be underwater. There's gonna be additional requirements there. We're gonna ask two minutes, good. I'll go well, two, two, two times as fast. Um, <laughs> additional areas near shore where we, that are expected to be inundated, there are going to be additional um, requirements placed on, on those types of developments, looking at alternatives, um, looking at climate impact assessments. Um, so let's talk a little bit, yeah, that's that. Um, PowerPoint's great, you should check it out. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we, um, how we work to incentivize redevelopment for the state of New Jersey, right? So you gotta pay for it, right? We don't necessarily get $50,000 every time we give somebody a check, but um, I'm gonna talk to them about how we do that. But um, through, through the, our economic development uh, authority, through the department, through HDRSF funding, um, through the New Jersey iBank, we are trying to provide funding to folks at you know, you know, very low interest rates, competitive, or, um, or in some instances, zero interest rates to be able to make improvements in those areas, right? So that funding is available for folks. There's loans, there's grants. Um, and we really wanna be able to find better ways to reuse our contaminated property, right? Whether it's to remediate it, whether it's to build on it. You know, we wanna see solar on most of our landfills. We wanna, the landfills that we can't put solar, we wanna turn into parks. Like we wanna make these things really valuable, right? And we believe, obviously, as the state of New Jersey and the Department of Environmental Protection, that you know, economic value can come from more than just building another building, right? Building a park, building something that folks can, can, can latch onto that can kind of improve your, your quality of life, you know, has economic benefits that are more than just the footprint of that structure. So we wanna provide funding there, you know, through all the things that we're talking about, we're working to try to um, increase um, smart and informed development um, opportunities. And lastly, um, if you wanna know where in the state you can find a brownfield, we're working to create that, that layer, right? That seems like a, a, a piece of information that if we wanna see folks um, do beneficial redevelopment, we should tell them where those, where those sites are. So we have a brownfield inventory GIS layer um, that we've recently developed. We know it's in uh, 12 municipalities that are part of our community collaborative initiative, which is where you know, we kind of um, work more directly, time's up, um, with communities uh, to identify their needs. So we're trying to kind of identify where those brownfields are so we can really focus our efforts there. Um, and we're gonna be continuing to update that with even more um, cities within the state. We hope that, that that information will be beneficial for folks. So, you know, look at the brownfields inventory, look at EJ map, um, review our rules. If you wanna know what we're doing, you wanna know how that's gonna affect kind of the future of development, the future of remediation in the state, 
that's what we're going to do. So thank you. Great job, second Sean. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't go after him. You'll see why. <laughs> so we have um, time for some questions. We covered a lot here. So if you have any questions, yes. Vapor barrier intrusion, including TCE, discovered by DEC at sites in the Guamis area, have currently come into public awareness. TCE is the same toxic contaminant that was led to a health crisis at Camp Lejeune. Vapor barriers, as a remedy, face many known challenges, including limits on the longevity of their effectiveness and the need for proper monitoring and testing and perpetuity. In Gowanus, the rising water table will likely lead to toxic contamination breaching engineered vapor barrier solutions. The question is not if, but when this will happen. And in many cases, the high water table is already restricting DEC's ability. Do you have a question? Yes. Given these challenges, how can EPA, DEC, and DEP represent to lenders and insurers that these development projects in the Gowanus are safe to proceed? And if these redevelopment projects are safe, why are your agencies telling developers in the Guanus area to seek environmental impairment policies oh. from an A-rated insurer? Okay, so. <laughs> um, do you want me to? Yes, would yeah. you like to take that one? <laughs> so, <laughs> as, I, I, as I noted before, there's a distinction in between the, the, the state's role um, at Gowanus and other areas like Newtown Creek in New York City um, and EPA's role. So EPA is very focused on the canal itself and the state is um, taking care of those sites that have largely come um, through the Brownfield Cleanup Program, so through our voluntary program um, as remedial sites. Um, as part of the, the, the Brownfield Cleanup Program, even though it's a voluntary program, we do um, designate sites as, some of those sites as significant threat sites. Um, so they have um, sort of ad additional components of the Brownfield Cleanup Program law are, are triggered when that, when that happens. Um, so in terms of uh, different remedial techniques um, that are um, preferred and allowed um, under state law, um, vapor barriers are used in many different places, for sure, um, but they could be, there could be site-specific considerations um, in different places. Um, I will pull the attorney card a little bit and say that I can't speak to, um, you know, technical questions about vapor barriers, but uh, the, all of our remedies that are selected for all of our sites go through a public process. Um, and so I would invite folks who think that there is a proposed remedy um, that's inappropriate to um, interface with our agency during that process. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yes. Sean, uh, I recognize that um, oh. you didn't mention uh, managed retreat or buyouts. Uh, is that too toxic, so to speak? I mean, I don't think you'll ever hear anybody from the department talking about managed retreat, but we will talk about buyouts for sure, because um, mm -hmm. that's not managed retreat, right? No. So we are, um, <laughs> we have a we have a, an existing and, and pretty robust state program for for flood buyouts, and um, we're also you know in the process, and it's been it's been a process of obtaining authority to spend federal funding um, for IDA recovery, and we have a lot of folks who are out of their homes. A lot of folks are still paying mortgages on places that they can't live, and we need to get in there and help them. Um, one of the things that we've done recently, which I think is um, a, you know, a, real, a real smart move by the commissioner, I've been fortunate to work on that, is to kind of realign the way we focus our work um, more from a more proactive and planning perspective and less of a reactive disaster, disaster recovery perspective. So we've kind of seeded the planning um, activities and kind of the identification of areas in which we should prioritize um, buyouts under our chief resilience officer, Nick Angarone. Um, he and his staff are kind of doing, you know, data analysis, looking at flooding um, patterns and, and all of that, and, you know, giving us 
um, guidance on where to focus. And what we try to do there is kind of use available state funding to focus in those areas and try to marry up that analysis um, with, with what we're gonna do with the federal funding. We've had a lot of success there in terms of being able to identify what we think are the most vulnerable um, places and places that we really should spend that money. Um, I think what you're also gonna see as the IDA funding is spent um, are some lines being drawn by the state as to what's appropriate to, to buy out and what's appropriate to elevate, right? There are, there are areas of the state um, subject to repeated flooding that would be, I think in our view, unwise to invest um, strictly in elevation, even if that is the homeowner's preference. So there's gonna be some difficult discussions about that. There's gonna be some difficult, difficult um, decisions to be made. Um, and if that looks like you know, some form of random retreat to people, I wouldn't disabuse them of that notion, but I'll never say that again in public. <laughs> More questions? Isaac? Um, Sean, another question for you, actually. Uh, I was uh, thinking about the five-foot number you, uh, you talked about before, and I'm just yeah. for a clarification. Does, is that number inclusive of storm surge, uh, sewage backup, wastewater backup, or is that independent of? So that's in, so that is like, that's in addition to what we would, we would look at as like our 100 or 500 year storm, right? So we're adding five feet on top of that um, to try to account for what, what sea level rise will do to that surge. Again, not saying you can't build there, but we want folks to have you know, a, a level of awareness as to what we should expect there. And ultimately, and I think critically, we want the folks to buy those properties, maybe one owner or two owners down the line, to have notice and disclosure of what they're purchasing. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, if, if folks continue to, you know, to move forward without knowledge, all of that liability is gonna fall back to the state as we see over and over again. And right, we need to, we need to correct for that. Any more questions? My speaker here, Audrey Friedrichson from Scenic Hudson. So we're glad to hear you mentioning the work that's starting to be done sensitively in the lower Hudson. Uh, we're one of those environmental groups that asked for the angler surveys. We'd love to talk to you about them and hope GE pays for them. But really my question is for <laughs> Sean to speak first. Uh, the lower Hudson Superfund site extends all the way down into New Jersey. So my question is whether or not DEP or your, your agency is planning to get involved in the lower Hudson at all. Yeah, absolutely. I'll pull, the, I'll pull the attorney card and say I don't have the specifics on that either. But yes, we will be involved. Hi, yeah, I'm Jackie Klopp from the Columbia Climate School. I'm curious how you're engaging with the U.S. Army Corps and how you might leverage the New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary Study. And I'm also very curious about... Um, if there are ways to accelerate remediation, because my understanding is the Army Corps will not go into areas that have not been properly remediated with some of their work. Um, so I'm, I'm curious on those two issues. Thanks. All yours. Um, that is also my understanding, um, that the uh, Army Corps um, has a policy where they will not uh, undertake their work unless they have a clean site, their clean site policy. Um, so I, I, I hope that that can um, accelerate some remediation throughout the city, the, those processes. To, to answer your, your first question, we work with them um, often and very closely. So um, I spend a lot of time on the phone with folks from the Army Corps at um, very high levels um, in the district here. Um, so we're really working with them hand in hand to make sure that the communities around um, New York are protected um, by these projects that have been underway. And there's a number of them. Um, and there have been a number of successes that they have had over, over time um, in, in some areas. I think um, out in the Rockaways in particular, they've completed a number of projects there. Um, but there's also the ongoing um, um, project out in Staten Island um, that's a big focus for the state of New York and um, also the Army Corps. And uh, I believe that we're gonna see some movement on that um, relatively soon. Um, but there are issues about the clean site policy that, that we have been working to, to overcome on that project as well. And I guess the, lo the larger HATS um, study um, that impacts all of us, uh, is an exciting proposal in, in a lot of ways, and it's also you know, concerning um, for communities. Um, there are a lot of trade-offs, I think, that are gonna be necessary um, over time, 
But that's a very, very large study that has a very large scope and it has a very large long time frame as well. Um, so I think there's going to be many, many opportunities for communities to impact that process as it moves forward. And uh, I think the Army Tor Corps has, has um, taken a lot of input from state agencies and has done a lot of outreach. And so we're happy to see how much outreach they've done with communities thus far. Um, and looking forward to keep working with them on that process. Yeah, I think we've worked very, very well with NYDEC as well as the city um, on the HAT study, and there's a lot to unpack there, right? I think you know, the, the thing that I always go back to when we talk about interactions with the Army Corps, um, which are you know, many with us, right? We have, a, we have projects in, in Hoboken. We're, you know, we're, we're working on a lot of stuff with the Army Corps. Um, despite investments of billions of dollars, um, we can't engineer our way out of this, right? I think folks, I think folks are aware of that at this point. So, you know, we're going to continue to take advantage of those opportunities. We're going to continue to look at those, you know, from a, you know, as the, as the Army Corps does from a cost-benefit perspective, um, and try to make wise investments that are going to hopefully help um, with storm surge and maybe maybe some of the sea level rise. But, you know, we're not, we can't, um, we can't expect that that's going to deliver us from this problem, right? So, we're going to continue to work on our regulatory and investment investment strategies to to, to try to try to provide more resilience for the state. Um, while continuing, you know, in a on a parallel track with all all of the good stuff that we can do with Army Corps. And one more question. This is kind of a self-interest uh, question. I was the RA who put out in 2000 uh, the or a draft order for GE to clean up the river because they just wanted people not to eat fish. So when you mentioned PFAS, is that also GE or is it some other entities that put them in there? And where the heck does it stand now with, with uh, GE doing something? I know they did some cleanup up, up river, but where are you with that? Are they still fighting you at every step of the way? Yeah, so I'm not 100% looped into that process, so I wouldn't be able to give you like an up to the minute update. But my understanding is is that there, you know, the movement down to the lower Hudson is underway right now, and that negotiations are ongoing. But um, you know, that's an that's an EPA lead as well. So I don't know if there's anything more that can be said about it at this time. Yeah, sorry, I don't have anything to add to that. Gene, uh, can you hear me? I can take a stab at that uh, for EPA. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I think you pen. asked about PFAS in the Hudson. First, I'd, if I heard you right. Well, I think Pat, did you mention PFAS in the Hudson? No, PCBs. Just everywhere else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, in, it's in all of us right now, I think. It's, short, it's shorter to list the places it's not. <laughs> Oh, in the Hudson Valley. Uh, sorry, I, I might have been. No, I, I wasn't talking about PFAS in that part. Sorry. Okay. So, so yeah. So no, we've made a lot of progress, and and, and GE uh, did a, a, bit, a major dredging project under a settlement with us in in the Upper Hudson. So that's good. And now we're looking at the Lower Hudson, and uh, the work is ongoing. And we're also looking at the the floodplains. Uh, where PCBs have landed. So we're working cooperatively with GE on that uh, as we speak. And can people eat fish now? There are, there are restrictions. <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are long-standing fish advisories for the Hudson that I would urge everybody to take a look at. Yeah. <laughs> and this is the end of our panel. So um, I have an administrative item. Please be back by 1.45. And lunch is outside, so um, you have, we actually ended five minutes early. We gave you five extra minutes for lunch. Yay! <laughs>